So we need to start with a definition for nutrition. And it's really the process by which organisms do two things. They obtain energy to help maintain life functions. So things like they absorb glucose and that is respired to make ATP that drives enzyme reactions and protein synthesis. And nutrition also means the taking in of molecules to allow matter to be created and maintained. So things like amino acids are needed to be able to build proteins that create cells, that create structures. Now, we know there's two uh, forms of nutrition. One is called an autotroph and one is called a heterotroph. So autotrophs include two types of organisms. Organisms like the plants that can photosynthesize. So photosynthesize. And organisms like some bacteria that can chemosynthesize. So we know photosynthesis is where light energy is converted to chemical energy in the form of glucose. And we know chemosynthesis is where the energy released from inorganic reactions is used to build more complex organic molecules such as glucose. So these two processes build complex organic molecules. And these organisms therefore essentially make their own food. Now heterotrophs are actually quite different because these cannot make complex organic molecules. So they have to consume them. So these consume complex organic molecules as part of their diet, as part of their nutrition. And these include organisms like all fungi, such as yeast cells, which are unicellular fungi. They have to take in glucose from their environment. All animals we know are heterotrophs. They cannot photosynthesize. They cannot chemosynthesize. We know animals include things like um, the insects, which are arthropods, uh, fish, mammals, which are chordata, and also earthworms, which are annelids. So they also cannot make their own complex organic molecules. They have to take them in as part of their diet. Now, we know there's four main types of heterotroph. Uh, the saprophytes include all fungi and also some bacteria that cannot photosynthesize. So bacteria can also be uh, heterotrophs as well. Now, these secrete enzymes outside the cell, and these enzymes digest complex molecules outside the cell. So we call it extracellular digestion. And the products of this uh, digestion are then absorbed into the cells across the cell membrane of these organisms. So they secrete enzymes, they digest their food outside the organism, and the breakdown products are then absorbed into the cells and utilized now, holozoic feeders have to ingest complex organic molecules and they then digest them in a very specialized internal, so a specialized internal digestive system. So we know our digestive system as holozoic feeders uh, includes the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine and the large intestine. Now, parasitism is um, another type of or mode of nutrition, if you like, whereby the organism lives within or on the surface of, so we could say on the surface of, a host organism. And the parasite always uh, obtains nourishment from the host at the expense of the health of the host. So they always cause harm to the host and occasionally even death to the host. So a nice example of this would be uh, wasp larvae. So a female wasp will inject her fertilized eggs inside a caterpillar, which is actually the larval stage of a butterfly. And these fertilized eggs develop inside the caterpillar into larvae. And the larvae feed off the tissues of the uh, caterpillar. They do not touch the delicate internal organs of the caterpillar. Uh, they feed off the non-essential tissues. And that causes essentially, ultimately, harm and death to the um the caterpillar, which is the host organism. Now, mutualism is slightly different, and we'll see this uh, very shortly. Uh, this is where we've got two types of organism that have a beneficial relationship. So things like ruminants, so ruminants like the cow or the sheep, they have one part of their stomach called the rumen. So it's the first chamber of the stomach. It's a four-chambered stomach. 
and that contains cellulase, so cellulase secreting bacteria. And these help to digest cellulose and they allow organic acids to be produced that get absorbed by the cow and used for energy. Now the cow offers these uh, cellulase secreting bacteria a protective environment in which to replicate and, and grow. So it's mutualistic. Now, if we start with the human digestive system, uh, we know it's basically a big long tube and there are certain specialized structures um, along the length of this uh, digestive tube, otherwise known as the alimentary canal. So we're gonna see that there are four main uh, parts to human digestion. The first one is called ingestion. So ingestion. And that's because we're holozoic feeders, we have to take in complex organic molecules, ready-made organic molecules through the mouth into the buccal cavity. We've then got digestion. And we know digestion starts in the mouth because salivary amylase is secreted. We know digestion also occurs in the stomach because proteins start to get broken down in the stomach by endopeptidases. 90% uh, of digestion in our digestive system occurs in the small intestine where proteins are completely broken down to amino acids. Um, carbohydrates are completely broken down into their individual monomers. And we know triglycerides are broken down into fatty acids and glycerol. So the third job of the digestive system after digestion has occurred inside the ileum, the small intestine, is absorption. So absorption of these breakdown products of digestion. So we then absorb amino acids into our bloodstream across the small intestine called the ileum. We absorb fatty acids and glycerol. We absorb amino acids, sugars, mineral lines, etc. Now the fourth process is called egestion. So that is where we actually egest as feces anything we can't actually break down through digestion. So we do not make or secrete cellulases, so we cannot break down cellulose in plant material. We also do not have mutualistic bacteria, such as the cow or even rabbits do. So because we don't have mutualistic bacteria, um, these bacteria, because they're not present, there's no cellulase enzymes, so the cellulose we can't break down and it becomes part of the egested fiber material. Now, Fiber, even though we can't digest it and absorb the breakdown products, is very important because it does stimulate peristalsis. So the smooth muscle wall called the muscularis, we know that can contract and relax. There's the circular muscle and the longitudinal muscle. That's really important to allow the bolus of food to go in a single direction through the alimentary canal. So we know at the top here, we've got the buccal cavity. We know salivary amylase. So salivary amylase is part of saliva, as well as a bit of mucus and alkaline, it's an alkaline solution. So we know in the mouth, the breakdown of starch is initiated, as well as some mechanical digestion here. And we know starch is made of amylose and amylopectin. So we get some mechanical breakdown, as well as some chemical enzymatic breakdown of starch. Now we know the food that we eat, the bolus of food goes down the esophagus and it ends up in the stomach. So we know the esophagus is a muscular tube and we know peristalsis is the method by which, so we can say here peristalsis, the bolus of food goes down into the stomach. Now if you drink liquid, that gets down into the stomach within seconds, about six or seven seconds. Um, sometimes food takes a little bit longer than that to get down into the stomach, but it's still fairly rapid. Now, this structure here at the end of the esophagus is called the sphincter. So that is called here the cardiac, we'll see in a minute, the cardiac sphincter. And it's basically a... Um, a valve made of muscle and it allows the food that comes down the esophagus into the stomach. So the stomach is really a muscular bag. So this bit here. 
And in the stomach, we find hydrochloric acid. So the pH is about one to two. So it's very acidic, very low pH. And we find pepsin. Now, pepsin is an enzyme that works optimally at this very low acidic pH. So we could say optimum pH. Now, pepsin is what we know as an endopeptidase. So endopeptidases break down big long proteins or polypeptide chains into shorter peptide fragments. So at this point, amino acids aren't released, but shorter peptide fragments are released because to break down proteins, it's a, a stepwise process whereby the protein is first broken down into smaller fragments and then the amino acids get cleaved off the end of the shorter fragments in the uh, ileum further down. Now we know in this muscular sac um, is hydrochloric acid and the main job really of the hydrochloric acid is to kill off, so kill off potential pathogens from our food. So most pathogens will not be able to survive in the very low pH of the stomach acid. So things like fungi and certain strains of bacteria will be killed in the very acidic gastric juice which is secreted from the stomach wall. Now, there's another muscular um, sphincter or valve, if you like, called the pyloric. So this time the pyloric uh, sphincter, sphincter, pyloric sphincter. Now, that is, if you look here, around about this position. And that is a muscular valve that allows the bolus of food from the stomach down into the duodenum. So if I just highlight this bit here, so this is now the small intestine that extends outwards from the stomach and the duodenum is the first 20 centimeters of the small intestine. And hopefully you might be able to see here, not only does the bile duct enter the duodenum, so if I just highlight the duodenum is this bit here, also the pancreatic duct enters the duodenum. So we get bile from the gallbladder that was originally made by the liver. It moves down the bile duct into, so that's the bile duct, into the duodenum. Pancreatic juice made from the pancreas, this structure in yellow, moves down into the duodenum as well. Pancreatic juice contains many different enzymes to help in the digestion of carbohydrates and proteins and lipids. And that starts in the duodenum. Now, the wall of the duodenum has specialized glands called Brunner's glands. And those Brunner's glands secrete an alkaline mucus, which has two jobs. It neutralizes the acidic bolus of food from the stomach. And it also provides a protective layer of the epithelial cells of the duodenum. So these cells are not digested by the uh, digestive enzymes released into it from the pancreas. So we know the pancreas is what we call an endocrine gland. So it does secrete hormones, but it also, things like insulin, it also makes digestive enzymes. So in the pancreas, we've got pancreatic, pancreatic juice. Now that contains pancreatic amylase to help break down the starch, the amylose and amylopectin. It contains an enzyme called trypsinogen, which is another endo peptidase so it breaks down larger proteins or polypeptide chains into small short shorter fragments now trypsinogen is an inactive form of um, endopeptidase so there's another enzyme made from the pancreas called enterokinase and what this enzyme does it actually cleaves off a portion of trypsinogen to activate it releasing the active trypsin and that's the endopeptidase that's going to continue the breakdown of proteins. Now, after the duodenum, the remainder, so I'll do it in green, the remainder of the small intestine, this big long tube, about 20 foot in length, this is called the ileum. So this is where 90% of the food that you eat gets broken down and then absorbed into the bloodstream. So 
of the food that you eat here, 90%, is actually broken down, digested in the ileum, which is the main part of the small intestine. So we get loads of digestion here. So things like um, short polypeptide fragments are broken down into dipeptides. Dipeptides are broken down into amino acids, which are both absorbed. We know starch is broken down to maltose. Maltose is broken down to alpha glucose. These are both absorbed again into the blood. We know triglycerides are broken down into fatty acids and glycerol. And again, these are absorbed not into the blood, but into the lacteal, which is a lymphatic capillary. So it's not just digestion, it's also absorption. So the ileum has two roles to play, digestion and absorption of uh, soluble molecules or ions that we can then use um, when they're distributed around the body. Now, anything that is not digest digested or absorbed, things like cellulose, for example, they pass into this bigger structure called the colon. Now, the colon has a certain structure that goes up called the ascending colon. It then transcends across the body, so this big tube in red, and then you've got the descending colon. Yeah. So this red tube, this big thick red tube, is called the colon. So the food this time goes down here, the descending part of the colon, and any undigested food gets stored in the rectum and then it gets egested, egested from the body as feces. Now there is an important part role to play of the colon. Now we know it contains bacteria, these good bacteria involved in um, secreting certain chemicals. So some of the bacteria can absorb uh, molecules within the bolus of food. They then synthesize quite often very important vitamins like vitamin K, vitamin K1 and K2. And we then absorb these vitamins that are made from the bacteria across the wall of the colon and into the bloodstream. Now, we also know lots of water does get absorbed at the, um, at the colon into the bloodstream. Now, water can also be absorbed in the ileum uh, as well as the colon itself. So we know a lot of food contains uh, water and we absorb this through the wall of the colon. Now, if we look at the digestive system of rabbit, it kind of looks very similar to what we've just seen in the human. So it has an esophagus and it has a muscular sac at the end of the esophagus called the stomach. Now, inside the stomach is hydrochloric acid and also pepsin, which we know is an endopeptidase. So breakdown of uh, protein starts in the stomach, the hydrolysis of uh, protein to shorter polypeptide fragments. You can see here after the stomach is this big long tube called the small intestine. So this big windy tube here is the ileum. And that has the same role as the human ileum. So we know it's going to digest 90% of the food that's taken in by the rabbit, things like Proteins get digested here, triglycerides get digested here, and also the breakdown products get absorbed in the ileum, much like in the human. But we know there's the, the diet of the rabbit is very different from humans because it's largely vegetation based, so grasses and things like this. Now, we know there's lots of cellulose from plant material. So these rabbits have what we call mutualistic bacteria that secrete cellulase enzymes. But these bacteria are actually found in the first part of the large intestine, um, this bit here that extends outwards, called the cecum. So this is an extension of the large intestine at the end of the small intestine. And inside the cecum are mutualistic bacteria that secrete cellulase enzymes. Now, these cellulase enzymes break down the uh, straight polysaccharide chains, so straight chains of uh, polysaccharide made of beta glucose that collectively form uh, hydrogen cross links to form microfibrils to release beta glucose. And that beta glucose 
ends up as part of the fecal pellet. So what's left of this digestion gets passed down the rest of the large intestine as a fecal pellet, a small round pellet, and it gets egested out of the rabbit. So the fecal pellets that get egested out will actually have a lot of glucose in them. So they're going to be quite sweet tasting. Now, the rabbit hasn't been able to uh, absorb the glucose here because the digestion of the uh, cellulose occurred after the small intestine, which is where absorption would normally take place. So what the rabbit does, it um, eats the fecal pellets. Now, it's only going to eat the fecal pellets that have a sweet taste because it knows they contain glucose from the digestion of cellulose. And this is called refection. Eating of the sweet fecal pellets. Now, when these sweet fecal pellets get taken in through ingestion, we know they pass down the esophagus into the stomach. We know it, the bolus of food passes down the ileum. And this time, the glucose that was in the fecal pellet can be absorbed across the ileum wall into the bloodstream. So the fecal pellets that get eaten this time, the glucose can get absorbed into the bloodstream of the rabbit and any more fiber, anything that can't be digested passes straight through. So the fecal pellets that end up being ingest, sorry, egested the second time are the harder fecal pellets. And these lack any glucose because it's been absorbed in the small intestine as um, the material passed through the rabbit a second time. So these would be hard fecal pellets. And these would have had the uh, glucose removed because it's been absorbed as um, the matter passed through the digestive system of the rabbit. Now, what you could do is um, if you're doing an experiment to look at the hard and the soft fecal pellets, now, we know the soft fecal pellets contain glucose, beta-glucose. So we could say beta-glucose. So you could do a Benedict's test. Now, when you do a Benedict's test, we know that's the test for a reducing sugar. You have to always heat the solution with the Benedict's reagent in a boiling water bath. So a boiling water bath. And what you can see here is a gradation of color. So if there's very little reducing sugars, it might be a sort of greeny, yellowy color. And the more reducing sugars are present, we're going to have an orangey color going to brick. If there's lots of reducing sugar, brick red. So the Benedict's reagent is actually, we know it's a blue color to start with. And if there's lots of reducing sugar, we're going to get a dark brick red color. Now, if there's only a little tiny bit of reducing sugar, such as the hard fecal pellets, that might produce a greeny colour, indicating a very small amount of reducing sugar, if any. Now, the cow is a ruminant, so this is slightly different to the rabbit. And the stomach is much more complex, if you like, and it's got four chambers. So what the cow does, it eats it, the grass or the vegetation. So this, this line in green will kind of follow this up. Now, this gets passed up the esophagus by peristalsis. So we can put peristalsis. And it goes into the first chamber, which is called the rumen. So number one here is the rumen. And this big structure here is a big chamber. Inside this are mutualistic bacteria that secrete cellulase enzymes. So this is the first chamber of the four-chambered stomach in the cow. So here we've got cellulase enzymes being secreted from, from uh, mutualistic bacteria. And what these do is they take the straight chains of cellulose and they break or hydrolyze the glycosidic bond to release the beta glucose. Now these bacteria actually absorb the beta glucose and they use some of it in respiration, but they also convert some of the glucose to what we call organic acids and these get secreted from the bacteria into the rumen now organic acids can be absorbed across the wall of the rumen into the blood of the cow so this is how the cow gains energy from the rumen
by the absorption of organic acids that are released from the uh, mutualistic bacteria. Now, what's left is called CUD, and that gets passed into chamber number two called the reticulum. So it's actually this little chamber here. Let me just show this bit here. Okay, so this is the reticulum. Now here are also some cellulase secreting bacteria. So there's further digestion of any cellulose, and there's also a bit of mechanical breakdown of the cud as well. Now from this point, if we look at the red arrow, the cud gets passed back up the esophagus, back up the esophagus towards the mouth for further chewing of the food. So we know the teeth, the molars, and the premolars at the back of the jaw of the cow, they're going to have that characteristic W to M arrangement for grinding vegetation. We know it's a, um, a horizontal movement of the jaw. That means side to side. We know that makes these ridges sharper over time. And we know the cow is a herbivore. It has unrestricted roots to allow continuous growth of the teeth because they get ground down over time. So we get a bit more mechanical. So we could say here mechanical digestion occurring in the mouth and the cud then gets re-swallowed back down the esophagus but this time it doesn't go into the rumen chamber number one <clears throat> it goes into uh, chamber number three and that's called the uh, amasum so chamber number three so if that's number one the rumen we know the reticulum is number two chamber number three is the amasum, this one here. Now this is where water is absorbed from the grass material in the third chamber. So the water from the plant vegetation gets absorbed into the blood of the cow here. So this is going to be water. And what's left of the cud gets passed into the fourth chamber which is actually called the abomasum. So this would be chamber number four. Now the abomasum is very similar to the human stomach and we know it contains hydrochloric acid and endopeptidases. So here proteins start to get digested very much like the human stomach. So this is really the, the abomasum is called the true stomach of the cow because this is where the protein starts to get broken down. Now within the cud in the abomasum, the true stomach, there will also be some of these cellulase secreting bacteria that are brought along with the plant material. So we know because of the, the very low pH, the acidic conditions, the kind of gastric juice, that's gonna kill a lot of these bacteria and um, everything gets taken into the ileum, the small intestine from the abomasum. So all this plant material is then taken into the small intestine. Here we get further digestion, so further digestion of food. And we also, more importantly, get, just as we would do in the human small intestine, absorption of the breakdown products of digestion into the blood. So this is the ileum. So we could say here ileum, the small intestine. So we know the, uh, the stomach of the cow has four chambers. The first three chambers are the rumen, the reticulum, and the omasum, and they're actually a modified lower esophagus. The fourth chamber, the abomasum, is actually the true stomach that contains endopeptidases like pepsin and hydrochloric acid, and that's where the protein starts to get down. That's where any pathogens will be killed as well. Now, if we look at uh, any part of the human gut, uh, it's going to have the same basic structure and it's made of four layers. So it doesn't really matter if we were to take the wall of the esophagus or the wall of the stomach or the wall of the duodenum up here or the small intestine, the ileum, further down the small intestine, or even the wall of the colon here. It would have the same basic four layered structure. Now, sometimes the in, inner layer, um, the mucosa, is going to look different depending on where the cross section is taken from but um, it's the same basic structure now the space inside is called the lumen so if this was the ileum 
inside this lumen here, we'd have a lot of digestive enzymes. So things like proteins would be broken down, lipids, triglycerides, we've broken down starch, we've broken down further, etc. Now, the very outside layer is called the serosa, and that's made of what we call connective tissue, so connective tissue. Now, this is pr uh, predominantly collagen. Now, we know the structure of collagen, if we just draw this at the bottom, it's actually made of elongated polypeptide chains, and there's three of them. And they're wrapped around each other in a rope-like structure. So we could say rope-like. Now these are held together by hydrogen bonds and the amino acid sequences down each polypeptide chain normally re get repeated. And that produces what we call a fibrous protein. So the serosa really is to help protect the gut, the gut wall. And it also protect, prevents too much friction with other internal organs inside the body. Now, the layer beneath the outer serosa is called the muscularis. So we can see here this layer that I've shown in blue. This actually is the muscularis. On the very outside is the connective tissue here called the serosa. Now, the outer layer of the muscularis is called longitudinal muscle. And the inner layer of the muscularis is called the circular muscle. Now, you can kind of see here in the uh, longitudinal muscle layer, it has actually got circles on this diagram. So why would it be called longitudinal muscle if we can see circles? Why is it not the circular muscle layer? Well, that's because this is a cross section. So, for example, if we drew the tube going this way, this would be the outer longitudinal layer. And then on the inside would be the circular muscle layer going in this direction. So when we look at a cross section of the longitudinal muscle, it looks like little circles because these are the ends of the muscle fibers. So the inner circular muscle, we can actually see kind of goes this way. Around the lumen, if you like, of the air. Uh, this part of the gut wall. Now, these muscles work in tandem. So when the uh, when this part of the gut wall is relaxed, when it's not under peristalsis, the inner circular muscle is actually relaxed. So the inner circular muscle is relaxed, and it's the outer longitudinal muscle that is contracted. So contracted. Now this is not when peristalsis occurs. When peristalsis occurs at one point of the gut wall, it's the opposite. So the inner circular muscle contracts and the outer longitudinal muscle then relaxes. And this wave of contraction, if you like, passes down the, um, the gut. And that's what we know as peristalsis to push the bolus of food through the gut in a single direction. Now, the third layer beneath so beneath the um, muscularis, so this layer here, if we just do that maybe in green, there you go. That's called the submucosa. Now the submucosa contains a number of uh, different structures, such as nerve cells. So we could say nerve cells. Now these nerve cells help to innervate the uh, muscularis on the outside of it. And you need nerve impulses to stimulate contraction of the muscularis. So this is part of the autonomic nervous system, those involuntary nervous signals that allow, for example here, the smooth muscle to um, contract or relax. Now we also have what are called lymph vessels in the submucosa. So we'll see later uh, certain molecules that get absorbed in the small intestine, things like fatty acids, um, triglycerides, etc. They can't be transported uh, immediately in the blood, so they get absorbed into the lacteal, which uh, becomes part of the lymphatic system. So submucosa, we can see lymph vessels within it. Now, the mucosa is the uh, layer of uh, tissue on the very inside of the four-layered structure. So quite often, we're going to see glands within the mucosa.
So down the ileum, for example, we get glands that can secrete certain enzymes, things like lipases and amylases down the length of the ileum. So we get glands in the mucosa sometimes. Now, if this was the duodenum, we know the duodenum has Brunner's glands that secrete an alkaline fluid to help neutralize the acidic food from the stomach and also to make mucus that protects the lining of the duodenum. So those Brunner's glands would actually be located in the submucosa if it was the duodenum. So they're a bit further down inside the, uh, the duodenum wall. So we can have a look at this uh, in a bit more of a 3D picture, but it's the same four layered structure. Now we know the serosa's connective tissue made of collagen on the outside. We know beneath the serosa is the muscularis made of smooth muscle. There's the longitudinal muscle on the outside and the circular muscle on the inside of the muscularis. Beneath the muscularis is the submucosa. And we can see here there's actually nerve cells. So these in yellow are actually nerve cells. There's blood vessels to take away the absorbed food, for example, in the ileum. And there's also lymphatic capillaries. So this one in green might be a lymphatic capillary if this was the ileum. Now, the very inside layer is called the mucosa. We know there's epithelial cells that line the very inside of the mucosa. And we know if it's, for example, the uh, ileum, they're going to secrete mucus if they're goblet cells to protect the lining, the epithelial lining of the ileum. We know the space inside the gut is called the lumen. So these are the two longitudinal muscles, uh, sorry, muscularis muscles, the longitudinal muscle on the outside, the circular muscle on the inside. Now, we know if we go back to the serosa very briefly, we're going to put down the main jobs. Well, it, it reduces friction with other internal organs and it protects the gut wall because we know connective tissue is very tough, it's very fibrous, very strong. Now we know the muscularis has waves of contraction called peristalsis to propel the bolus of food in a single direction through the entire length of the gut. Now, if you don't have enough fiber in your diet, what can happen is you don't get this stimulation of the inner layers of the, uh, the gut wall. So fiber is very important to kind of push against the gut wall and stimulate peristalsis. So what happens if you haven't got enough fiber in your diet is quite often the lack of peristalsis. So the food kind of gets stuck. The bolus of food gets stuck within some part of the digestive tract and therefore you can become constipated. So a good, um, a good thing to do if you ever get constipated is to have more fiber in your diet because it can stimulate peristalsis. Okay. Now the submucosa underneath the muscularis, we know it's got some connective tissue in there. It's got blood vessels, lymph vessels, and nerves. Nerves help coordinate um, peristalsis from the muscularis. We know the mu uh, mucosa, it secretes mucus, hence the name, protects the epithelial cells of the, uh, for example, the ileum. We also know there are glands that secrete certain digestive enzymes, things like uh, amylase, lipase, and some uh, proteases. Now, if we look at the uh, longitudinal muscle here, what we can actually see is, like we said on the previous diagram, it is in this orientation along the length of the muscularis. So in cross section, the ends of these muscle fibers look like little circles. Now, the circular muscle is orientated in this way, surrounding the muscularis, which is why it doesn't look like little circles from the end. It looks like long threads of muscle tissue. So it's coordinated movement. When there's no peristalsis, the longitudinal muscle on the outside is contracted. The circular muscle is relaxed. When we get at point X, maybe this point here, point X, peristalsis, we know the longitudinal muscle contracts. Uh, sorry, the longitudinal muscle relaxes and the circular muscle does the opposite and it contracts at that point. Now, that will last for a very short period of time and then it reverts back to its original uh, state. So if we were to look at a cross section of the gut wall, and this is uh, the ileum cross section here, so the small intestine, the, the big part of the small intestine, we can actually see the four layers that we've just mentioned. 
So we've got on the outside the connective tissue made of collagen, which is the serosa, to help protect the uh, ilium wall and to prevent too much friction with other uh, internal organ organs around the abdominal region. The uh, longitudinal muscle is the outer layer of muscularis. The circular muscle is the inner layer of the muscularis. These have opposing uh, functions, if you like. So when the circular muscle contracts, the long longitudinal muscle is relaxed and vice versa. Now the submucosa is this section here. We can see it contains blood vessels, for the absorption of uh, food products, and it has lymphatic capillaries in there as well, as well as lots of nerves to help coordinate peristalsis in the muscularis region. Now the mucosa is the inner layer of the ilium in this case. So we're gonna see there are glands within the mucosa down the length of the ilium. They can make digestive enzymes that get secreted into the lumen up here. So this is the space in the ilium along the length of the ilium. Now we know on the very uh, inside of the mucosa is a layer of cells called the epidermis. So epidermis is basically a sheet of cells that cover internal structures inside the body. So a sheet of epidermis cells uh, covers the inside of the gut wall, the ilium wall, and it's only one cell thick. So that's actually going to be quite a short diffusion pathway for molecules like glucose to move across or amino acids. So amino acids or even things like mineral ions, because we know we need to absorb minerals from our diet. So it's a short diffusion pathway into the bloodstream. Now, it's also a short diffusion pathway for things like fatty acids and glycerol that will get absorbed, we'll see in a minute, into the lacteal. So this structure here, if we just highlight the whole thing, is called a villus. And it's got epithelial cells lining the outside of the villus. So we've just talked briefly about the small intestine as a model for the, the four layers of the gut wall. Now, in this picture, the uh, ilium, the small intestine, would be this part here, and it's about 20 feet long. So it's a very, very long structure you find inside the abdomen. But we know before the ilium, the first 20 centimetres of the small intestine is called the duodenum. So this is the first 20 centimetres of the small intestine. Now, we know the stomach sits before the small intestine. So it's at the end of the esophagus and it's before the small intestine. And we know inside the stomach, we're gonna get gastric juice. So anything to do with the stomach is called gastric. Now it's the wall of the, the stomach called the gastric wall that secretes, it's got gastric glands within the, um, the mucosa layer that secretes hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen. Now, the pepsinogen, as we'll see in a minute, is an inactive endopeptidase, and it gets activated by hydrochloric acid. It cleaves off a portion of this inactive precursor to form the active pepsin. Now, we know inside the stomach there's going to be a pH of around about 2, so it kills any pathogens that you ingest on your food, and we also know pepsin has an optimum temperature, uh, sorry, pH of uh, around about pH 2. So we can actually see the four layers of the uh, gut wall here. So we've got longitudinal layer of uh, the muscularis on the outside. We've then got the circular layer beneath that. Uh, there is actually another layer here called the oblique layer. Now underneath the muscularis, we will have the uh, submucosa. On the very inside, we'll have the mucosa. Now we can actually just uh, briefly talk about, again, the uh, sphincters here. So we know this one here is going to be the cardiac sphincter. And that controls the uh, movement of the bolus of food from the esophagus down to the stomach. It also closes to prevent any backflow of um, acid or it prevents acid reflux back up the esophagus. Uh, the pyloric sphincter is this one here. And that is, again, it's like a muscular valve. And it allows what we call gastric efflux. So when the pyloric sphincter opens, it allows the bolus of food with a little bit of the, the acid within it to move into the duodenum. It then closes. 
So it's called gastric emptying. Now we know the duodenum in the uh, submucosa of the duodenum wall are Brunner's glands. And it's the Brunner's glands that secrete an alkaline, alkaline mucus from the submucosa into the lumen of the duodenum. And that neutralizes the acidic food from the stomach. It also provides a protective layer of mucus uh, for the enzymes so they don't digest the epithelial cells that line the duodenum. Now in this uh, duodenum structure, so this first sort of 20 centimeters or so of the small intestine, we're going to see in a minute, we get two ducts that open into this. We get the duct called the bile duct, so the bile duct from the gallbladder. And here we get bile that goes into the duodenum. And bile emulsifies fats. And it also is alkaline to help neutralize the food from the stomach. Now, the other duct that goes into the duodenum is the pancreatic. So we can say pancreatic duct. And we know the pancreas makes pancreatic juice containing lots of digestive enzymes, things like trypsin and amylase and lipase from the pancreas. So we also get digestion occurring in the duodenum as well because of these pancreatic enzymes. Now, if we actually look at the, uh, the wall of the stomach, uh, we can see these uh, gastric pits. So these little pits here, if you were to kind of go down them, you would see what we call gastric glands. So we know epithelial tissue is tissue that lines certain structures within the body. And if you go down the gastric gland here, what you'll see are certain specialized cells. So some specialized epithelial cells are called goblet cells and they make, store and then secrete mucus. Now it's very important that mucus is secreted from these specialized goblet cells because it prevents the epithelial cells being digested through um, pepsin once that's been activated. Now there's another type of specialized cell called oxyntic cells. So we can see them here in light blue. So these specialized oxyntic cells, they actually make hydrochloric acid. And that hydrochloric acid will make its way up to and into the stomach. So this would be hydrochloric acid made from oxyntic cells. So we say yeah, oxyntic cells. Now we know the hydrochloric acid is needed to kill off any pathogens that we might take in on our food but it also helps to activate what we call pepsinogen, the inactive precursor to pepsin. So cells towards the bottom of the um, gastric gland are called chief cells. So we can see at the very bottom, we've got lots of chief cells as part of the epithelium. So they're specialized epithelial cells and they release pepsinogen into the gastric pit. So the pepsinogen comes up this way into the stomach. We know the acid cleaves off a portion of the pepsinogen to make it active pepsin. And we know pepsin is then gonna to start to break down protein within the bolus of food that's been uh, taken in to the stomach. And we know pepsin, just as another recap, is an endopeptidase. We know it breaks down large or long polypeptide chains into shorter peptide fragments. So it's the first stage of protein digestion. Now, if you look at a microscope image of the uh, stomach wall, this is what you'll see. So you can see the gastric pits here, lots of them. And we know they lead down to the gastric gland. So for example, here, you'd have the epithelial lining, which you can kind of just see here. And that would go down all the way down here into the gastric gland. So we get that type of structure. So the gastric glands that make hydrochloric acid and also pepsinogen, 
are located in the mucosa, so the very inner layer of the stomach wall. And underneath, or on the outside, if you like, of the mucosa, we know we're going to get the submucosa. But the glands don't extend down into the submucosa. They're just the mucosa of the stomach wall. Now, you can actually see some blood vessels, some uh, veins, etc., and arteries within the submucosa. But the uh, oxyntic cells that make hydrochloric acid and the chief cells that make pepsinogen are located here in the epithelium lining of the gastric pit or gland, if you like. So the next thing we're going to talk about is um, the duodenum. Now, the duodenum, we know, is the first 20 centimeters of the small intestine. And we know inside the duodenum, we will find a material called bile. Now, bile is synthesized by the liver and it's stored in the gallbladder, a little kind of green sac sitting outside the liver. And that gallbladder is connected to the duodenum via the bile duct. Now, we know any duct is made of cuboidal epithelium. So even the pancreatic duct, the bile duct, these epithelial cells are kind of cube shaped. And they form like a little tube known as a duct. Now, the um, bile has a number of properties. It's called ampipathic. So the molecule, the, the bile salts are um, both hydrophilic on one side and hydrophobic on the other side. And that's why they can emulsify big droplets of oils and fats into thousands of tiny, tiny little droplets. So a multiplication of oil droplets is the result of bile or bile salts. That increases the surface area because we get thousands of smaller little oil droplets as opposed to a larger big droplet. So we've got a much bigger surface area. And because we've got a much larger surface area, the uh, lipase enzymes that are secreted from the pancreas, the pancreatic lipase enzymes, have a, a larger surface area to work on. So they can start to break down or hydrolyze the triglycerides into uh, three fatty acids and glycerol. Now, not only does bile help emulsify large oil droplets into thousands of smaller droplets by lowering the surface tension, and creating a larger surface area collectively. It's also alkaline. So it helps to neutralize the acidic food, the acidic bolus of food coming out of the stomach via the pyloric sphincter. So on this picture, we can actually see the gallbladder and the bile duct. Now we know this uh, big organ here is the liver. And we know that is where the bile salts are actually synthesized. Now, the liver's got lots of different jobs, things like detoxification of the blood, the breakdown of alcohol, it stores glucose or excess glucose as glycogen, etc. But it also makes uh, bile. Now, the bile uh, is stored within the gallbladder here, and it's released down the bile ducts into the duodenum. And we know the duodenum is the first 20 centimeters of the small intestine, like we just said. We know the bile salts emulsify larger fat droplets or oil droplets into many smaller ones by reducing the surface tension of these droplets and collectively with all these thousands of small droplets of oil we know lipase has a larger surface area to work on but the pancreas as well is another gland it's an endocrine gland because the pancreas actually makes hormones like insulin and glucagon glucagon both involved in regulating blood uh, glucose concentrations, but it also makes digestive enzymes. So some of the cells of the pancreas, maybe down this end of the pancreas, they actually synthesize uh, different enzymes which get released down the pancreatic duct down into the duodenum. Now these include things like pancreatic, pancreatic lipase. So we know the bile salts are going to emulsify uh, oil droplets, they make thousands of smaller oil droplets with a larger surface area. Pancreatic lipase is an enzyme that catalyzes hydrolysis of the ester bonds in a triglyceride. It releases fatty acids and glycerol, and they can then be absorbed 
across the wall of the ilium a little bit further down into the uh, lacteal now we also have pancreatic amylase that's secreted as part of pancreatic juice into the duodenum and we know this is going to hydrolyze glycosidic bonds alpha one to four glycosidic bonds uh, in starch because starch is made of amylose and amylopectin now there's also an endopeptidase called trypsin which is secreted by the pancreas as part of pancreatic juice but it's actually made and secreted as an inactive form called trypsinogen now it is inactive because if this was an active uh, peptidase that break down proteins and it was inside cells it would cause damage to the proteins inside the cells to actually make the enzyme so it has to be secreted in an inactive inactive form now the other part of pancreatic juice contains an, another enzyme called enterokinase and it's this enzyme that cleaves off a portion of trypsinogen to release the active trypsin inside the duodenum so inside the duodenum we have digestion or hydrolysis of triglycerides we have hydrolysis of starch to release maltose and we have hydrolysis of proteins to release shorter polypeptide chains now we know pancreatic juice is alkaline to help neutralize the acidic food from the stomach we know bile salts are also alkaline to do the same job and also we know in the wall of the duodenum in the submucosa of the duodenum are glands called Bruner's glands so these Bruner's glands Bruner's glands in the wall of the duodenum in the submucosa you can put that there submucosa they secrete an alkaline fluid a mucus like fluid and what that does it also neutralizes the acid food coming from the stomach but it also provides a protective layer so protective layer protective layer over the epithelial cells that line the duodenum and it stops these epithelial cells being digested by the enzymes released from the pancreas the pancreatic juice enzymes now when we look at the ileum which is the main part of the small intestine whereby we get most or 90 percent of digestion occurring so most of the digestion of your food occurs in the ileum and then we get absorption of those breakdown products so there's two roles of the ileum most of the digestion of food and virtually all of the absorption of the important molecules or ions released from that digestion now the inside wall of the ileum you can see here in this top picture it's actually folded like this folded inwards now these are not villi these are just folds of the wall of the ileum and that increases the surface area for um, absorption of products of digestion so if you look at this picture here on the left you can actually see these are not villi these are just folds here of the wall of the small intestine they're just folds now if you look a little bit closer you should be able to see there's extensions of the inside of the ileum wall and it's these that are the villi so you can see here these kind of projections increase the surface area again for secreting mucus for secreting enzymes and also for absorbing the products of digestion so we've got folding of the wall of the ileum we've got many many millions of villi that extend from each of the folds to further increase the surface area so this structure here on the right hand side is a single say here single villus so this is one of these extensions now you can see the cells that are one cell thick that form a tissue that lines each villus are called epithelial cells and if we look at these epithelial cells in a little bit more detail what we can see is they're specialized they've got a brush border of microvilli so if I just draw a very simple picture of this these are the microvilli so the villus is this elongated structure that projects from the wall of the ileum 
and the epithelial cells on the outside of the villus are specialized they're called microvilli projections from them so it's just a, a projection of the cell membrane of these epithelial cells and that forms the lining of the uh, ilium now you can see here there are actually specialized epithelial cells called goblet cells that we'll look at in a bit more detail next now these are cells that secrete and store mucus and they also when they release the mucus it's got several jobs because it does uh, protect the epithelial lining of the ileum from digestion uh, with the um, hydrolytic enzymes now inside the villus we can see uh, a very very rich blood capillary network so blood capillary network and within these uh, blood vessels we get absorbed glucose absorbed amino acids and absorbed ions so all the glucose that's been digested all the amino acids and all the ions get absorbed into the blood across the wall of the ileum now anything hydrophobic like fatty acids they can't be digested and absorbed straight into the bloodstream because they wouldn't dissolve in the plasma of the blood so fatty acids for example get absorbed into this green structure in the middle of the villus called the lacteal actually do that in green so this structure here is called the lacteal that extends up through the villus virtually to the top of the villus inside it and that is a lymphatic capillary so the fatty acids that get absorbed into the lacteal they get packaged in what are called lipoproteins uh, small spheres of phospholipid uh, phospholipid bilayer so inside that you've got fatty acids and triglycerides and eventually these liposomes will be uh, transferred back into the bloodstream because we know things like high density lipoproteins and low density lipoproteins are responsible for transporting different types of uh, triglyceride and we tend to get more saturated uh, triglycerides the saturated fatty acids in the low density lipoproteins as well as a bit more cholesterol so if we look at the villus in a bit more detail we can see the epithelial lining of the villus here on the outside now this picture in the middle does show a specialized epithelial cell called a goblet cell and it's this goblet cell that makes and secretes mucus so we can see here in a bit more detail if I draw in the cell membrane in red of this cell it's like this so that's the cell membrane and the mucus is secreted into this pocket here and then it gets secreted into the lumen of the ileum so that's a, a zoomed in picture at the bottom of a goblet cell so in this picture we can see the uh, epithelial cells that line the ileum we can also see the specialized goblet cells now if we have a look at a single epithelial cell here we can see it's a columnar shape so we call the epithelial cells that line the ileum columnar epithelium now obviously this is a uh, goblet cell here and it secretes this mucus so in this kind of pocket the mucus is stored and then it gets released into the lumen of uh, the ileum now what the mucus does it um, has a couple of jobs firstly it kind of sits on the outside of the epithelial lining and it provides a uh, protective surface so a protective surface to prevent the epithelial cells being digested by the hydrolytic enzymes that would be present in the lumen of the ileum uh, the mucus also helps to lubricate the bolus of food because we know that's going to pass down the ileum so this way by peristalsis and peristalsis occurs because of the uh, the contraction of the circular muscle and the relaxation of the longitudinal muscle on the outside of the muscularis so as the food is propelled down the ileum by peristalsis it's lubricated by some of the mucus secreted by the goblet cells along the length of the ileum so we need to know how glucose goes from the lumen of the ileum 
and gets absorbed across the epithelial cells into the blood plasma of the blood capillary network inside the villus. So imagine this area here was the lumen of the ileum. Well, we know we have glucose in our diet. Now, glucose, we, we just consume within some food. We know starch is a polysaccharide and we know glucose is a monosaccharide. Now, if we've got the monosaccharide, which is glucose in the lumen, it gets into the cytoplasm of the epithelial cell. So this picture on the left hand side, this phospholipid bilayer is the cell membrane of the epithelial cell. So imagine I highlighted this phospholipid bilayer here. So these are the microvilli, the folds of the cell membrane of the epithelial cell, and we know it's a phospholipid bilayer. So on the left hand side, this is like a zoomed in picture of what we would see on this blue line on the right hand side. Now we know glucose is a polar molecule because it's got OH groups with delta negative and delta positive. So we know glucose is quite a large sort of polar molecule. So it's going to have to get into the epithelial cell, this columnar epithelial cell by uh, or through some type of carrier protein and the mechanism is called co-transport so this particular globular tertiary protein in yellow here so this protein is an intrinsic membrane protein in the membrane of the epithelial cell it has a binding site for glucose so glucose can bind to this binding site and it also has a second binding site for sodium ions so when the sodium ions bind to their specific complementary shape binding site, the sodium ion is transported across the membrane by a change in shape of the carrier protein. Now, at the same time as the sodium binding to the binding site, glucose will also bind to its uh, respective binding site. And that also gets transported into the cell across the membrane at the same time as sodium does. Now, in order for this to take place, what's needed is a concentration gradient for sodium. So as long as there's higher sodium in the lumen and a lower sodium concentration in the cytoplasm, so this is the cytoplasm, the epithelial cell, then we know sodium ions are going to move through the carrier protein by facilitated diffusion. So we could say here facilitated diffusion and that allows the glucose to also be transported into the epithelial cell so as long as we've got both sodium ions and glucose in the lumen of the ileum they can be co-transported into the cytoplasm of the epithelial cell and once they're inside the cytoplasm so we could put here cytoplasm the glucose is going to be kept quite low so a low concentration of glucose inside the cytoplasm because it's actively transported out of the other side of the epithelial cell into a blood vessel using a glucose specific so glucose specific carrier protein now we also know sodium ions have to be kept low inside the cytoplasm of the epithelial cell to keep the sodium moving in by co-transport. So the sodium ions are also pumped out via a very specific sodium ion carrier protein from low concentration to high concentration. So it's gonna require the hydrolysis of ATP. So the sodium ions are actively pumped out of the epithelial cell against the concentration gradient into the blood. The glucose is also pumped out using active transport into the the blood uh, the plasma of the blood and it keeps both of them nice and low inside the cell and that allows glucose and sodium to keep coming into the epithelial cell through this co-transporter protein now if we've got a condition like cholera whereby in the lumen of the ileum uh, very watery substance is produced so you end up with watery diarrhea if you get cholera and it's caused by a bacterium that makes a toxin 
and that toxin activates a chloride ion uh, channel in the membrane of the epithelial cell so it switches that on so chloride ions are moved into the lumen of the ileum and that draws water out of the epithelial cells to make what will become that watery diarrhea and one of the ways of treating a patient with cholera is by giving them a rehydration solution that contains both sodium and glucose so you have to have both sodium and glucose in the rehydration solution because they only get taken up into the epithelial cell and into the blood if they're together um, and that's going to involve this as we said earlier intrinsic co-transporter protein in the epithelial cell membrane so we've uh, talked about how glucose gets absorbed from the ileum lumen across the epithelial cells those columnar epithelial cells into the uh, blood capillaries inside the villus but what about the more complex polysaccharide starch well we know starch is uh, started to it starts to be broken down from salivary amylase in the mouth okay so salivary amylase now the starch molecule because it's such a huge polysaccharide it will continue to be broken down in the duodenum and that's because of the action of pancreatic amylase so pancreatic amylase and along the length of the ileum it's about 20 foot of ileum the remainder of the small intestine there is uh, amylase enzymes secreted from glands uh, within the ileum wall so these enzymes all have the same catalytic activity and what they do is they start to break down the starch polysaccharide to release a disaccharide called maltose so if we had a starch grain we know that this is from plant material and we know there's two types of polysaccharide that make up the starch grain now the first one is called amylose and that's a big long polysaccharide chain in a helical or spiral structure and this forms the core of the starch grain so there'll be millions of these um, amylose polysaccharide chains in the middle of the starch grain and we know each amylose is made from thousands thousands of alpha glucose monomers so these little circles here represent the single alpha glucose monomers and we can see there's going to be thousands in a single chain now on the outside of the uh, starch grain we've got the second type of polysaccharide called amylopectin and this is slightly different to amylose because it's actually branched so we can see here the branched part of the uh, polysaccharide now we know the main chain of uh, alpha glucose monomers are linked by alpha 1 to 4 glycosidic bonds but the branch points of the amylopectin so these points here we know they're going to be alpha 1 to 6 glycosidic bonds and the amylopectin there's uh, thousands of these polysaccharides they actually are found on the outside of the starch grain so salivary amylase in the mouth pancreatic amylase in the duodenum and amylase released from the glands along the length of the ileum will start to digest these two polysaccharides and start to break down the starch now we know maltose is a disaccharide so starch is made of two polysaccharides amylose and amylopectin uh, the maltose is a disaccharide and that is made from two alpha glucose molecules uh, joined by an alpha 1 to 4 glycosidic bond so what happens is the amylase enzymes they cleave off maltose from the ends of the amylose chain or they cleave off maltose from the ends of the branches of amylopectin so what we get is amylase the enzyme here the active site of amylase can or is complementary in shape to the alpha 1 to 4 glycosidic bond and what that does it cleaves off thousands of maltose disaccharides and we're going to 
find the maltose disaccharide in the lumen of the ileum. Now we'll see on the next slide, the enzyme that's going to break down or hydrolyze maltose, the disaccharide, into individual alpha glucose monomers is called maltase. So if you see ASE, A is on the end of uh, a word, it's, it's the name of the enzyme. Now, maltase is not secreted into the lumen of the ileum. Instead, we find it on the cell membrane of the epithelial cells that line the ileum. So the final digestion or hydrolysis of maltose occurs by a maltase that is found in the epithelial cell membrane of all those epithelial cells that line the ileum. And that will uh, release two alpha glucose and the alpha glucose get released into the epithelial cell and then as we just saw on the previous slide the alpha glucose is pumped out of the epithelial cell by active transport through a glucose carrier protein and into the capillary vessels inside the uh, ileum uh, sorry inside the uh, villus okay now other um, disaccharides like lactose which is made from glucose and galactose joined by a glycosidic bond is digested by lactase which is also find, found in the cell membrane of the epithelial cells that line the ileum and another disaccharide that is uh, quite common in the food that we eat sucrose that is hydrolyzed by an enzyme called sucrase and again that is found in the cell membrane of the epithelial cells that line the ileum. Now we know sucrose is a disaccharide made from the uh, joining of glucose and fructose. So we know the enzyme sucrase, the, the active site of this enzyme, is complementary in shape to the shape of the sucrose disaccharide and it chemically inserts a molecule of water to hydrolyze the glycosidic bond and that is going to release both glucose and fructose into the epithelial cell that get pumped out of the cell into the bloodstream. Now, amylase, the enzyme, we, sometimes we see it written as alpha amylase. The active site here we know recognizes alpha 1 to 4 glycosidic bonds. So this alpha amylase is not complementary in shape, the active site, to the shape of cellulose. Now, we don't make, as humans, cellulase, and that is why we can't break down the cellulose microfibrils from the cell wall of plant cells. So that's what we call fiber. So because we do not make cellulase enzymes that would normally break down the or hydrolyze the hydrolytic, um, sorry, the glycosidic bonds in cellulose, we, uh, we can't break down cellulose, so it becomes fiber, and we just ingest all that cellulose. So we know about the enzymes that digest uh, polysaccharides and we've talked about starch in particular. Now we know starch is made of amylose and amylopectin. We know alpha amylase hydrolyzes the glycosidic bond to release these maltose disaccharides. And we know the enzyme called maltase is an enzyme that catalyzes the hydrolysis of the alpha 1 to 4 bond uh, between the two glucose monomers to release the individual glucose inside the epithelial cells. So if we look at a villus in this picture here on the left hand side, we know the epithelial cells, the columnar epithelial cells line the outside of the villus. And we know if we look at this picture here that a columnar epithelial cell kind of looks like this with the microvilli facing the lumen. So the actual enzyme maltase is located in this position. It's an intrinsic membrane protein or membrane enzyme. And that allows the maltose to be digested. And so the alpha glucose is released into, sorry, glucose there, into the cell. And that's going to be pumped out using the energy from hydrolysis of ATP into the bloodstream. And that helps also, like we said earlier, to keep the glucose concentration nice and low inside the epithelial cell. So we know from year one core concepts, we have to be able to draw maltose. So the picture at the bottom is uh, a molecular diagram of maltose. 
Now we know if we count the carbons on this side here on the left, there's going to be six carbon atoms. So four, five and six. Now carbon one is the carbon in the ring structure that is attached to the oxygen in the ring structure. So that's carbon one. And we know this carbon one is going to be connected to carbon four on the second alpha glucose. So if we put in here in orange, the glucose, uh, sorry, the carbon numbers, we know there's going to be six on the right hand side and it's carbon four that is going to form the link via the oxygen to carbon one. So this is an alpha one to four glycosidic bond. Now we know maltase inserts a molecule of water here. So it's the chemical insertion of water catalyzed by maltase and that's going to break or hydrolyze this glycosidic bond. And we're going to end up with a molecule of uh, glucose or two of them, actually. So if we look at this one on the right hand side here, we'll have two of these. But you can see on the carbon one, we've reestablished the OH group and we know that points down from carbon one. So we know this must be alpha glucose. If it was beta glucose, the OH group would point up from carbon one in the opposite direction. So we're going to get two alpha glucose from the hydrolysis of maltose. So we can now start to talk about the digestion of protein that we consume in our diet, that we ingest as holozoic feeders and uh, break down inside our internal digestive system. So we know proteins that we consume in our diet uh, might be globular proteins. So we know the cells and the tissues that we eat contain things like enzymes that we're going to break down into amino acids. Uh, we also know the proteins might be fibrous proteins. So we eat collagen as part of connective tissue in our diet as well. So there's all sorts of proteins that we consume. Now they're treated pretty much in the same way. So the first area in the digestive system that starts to break down proteins is in the stomach. And we know the stomach has gastric juice that contains pepsin and we know the optimum pH for pepsin is um, around about pH 2. So enzymes that break down proteins are called peptidases and there's two main types endo peptidases and they start the digestion of proteins and then exo peptidases and they finish the digestion of proteins to release individual amino acids. So this step on the left hand side here inside the stomach. Um, so the role of pepsin in the stomach and also things like pancreatic trypsin. They're what we call the endopeptidases. So they they hydrolyze peptide bonds. So these enzymes catalyze the addition of uh, a water molecule to break a peptide bond within the polypeptide chain. And that releases, imagine we had kind of a globular protein here, it releases shorter polypeptide fragments either into the stomach or into the lumen of the duodenum. We then have exopeptidases, so exopeptidases, and these uh, catalyze the hydrolysis of the terminal peptide bond from the short polypeptide chain to release individual dipeptides or in some cases the actual amino acids as well. So exopeptidases can release dipeptides or individual amino acids from the ends of the polypeptide chain. So it's a sequential digestion of a protein and it makes it more efficient. We have endopeptidases like pepsin in the stomach and uh, pancreatic uh, trypsin. They cleave the big proteins, the polypeptide chains, into shorter peptide fragments. The exopeptidases then cleave off by hydrolysis dipeptides and amino acids from the end of the shorter polypeptide. So again, we have to know how to draw a dipeptide, and that's core concepts from year one. So we know a dipeptide is made from two amino acids linked via a peptide bond. The peptide bond is the carbon to nitrogen bond between the two amino acids. We know each amino acid will have 
a variable group. So in a dipeptide, there's two variable groups. And we know the um, enzyme is going to insert, catalyze the insertion of water to break the C to N peptide bond through hydrolysis. So an enzyme that hydrolyzes a peptide bond to release two amino acids would um, end up with these uh, amino acids here on the right hand side. So we can see if we look at the carbon here on the left, that now has an OH group added to it. And if we look at the nitrogen on the right hand side of the peptide bond, after hydrolysis, that has a single hydrogen added to it. So we know OH plus hydrogen is water. So the chemical addition of water catalyzed by a pep peptidase enzyme is called hydrolysis. It reestablishes the OH group as part of the carboxyl group on the left here. And it adds in the hydrogen to reestablish the amine group on the amino acid on the right hand side. So if we look at um, endopeptidases in a little bit more detail, they catalyze the hydrolysis of um, peptide bonds within a polypeptide chain. So if we look at this picture here, we can see this enzyme has catalyzed the addition of water to break this C to N peptide bond to hydrolyze it. And it's going to release two products from the active site of the enzyme. One of them will be a shorter three amino acid polypeptide and the other one in this particular case will be a slightly longer eight amino acid polypeptide so it breaks the long polypeptide chains into shorter peptide fragments and this will be for example pepsin as we said in the gastric juice of the stomach and trypsin produced by the pancreas and it works in the duodenum now, we know exopeptidases cleave off the terminal amino acids or a terminal dipeptide. So they catalyze the addition of water to break the C to N peptide bond here. Or it could be obviously the terminal peptide bond. And in this case, it's released an amino acid. So amino acid. And it will continue to uh, catalyze the cleaving of amino acids from either side of the polypeptide chain. So eventually all the amino acids will be released into the lumen of the ileum and they get uh, absorbed into the epithelial cell and then uh, pumped out by active transport the other side of the epithelial cell into the bloodstream. Now, if we start to talk about the uh, digestion of lipids, well, we know lipids are essentially triglycerides now, in the duodenum of the um, small intestine, we get pancreatic lipase. So we know that's part of um, pancreatic juice. And this lipase enzyme from pancreatic lipase is uh, going to hydrolyze the ester bond in the triglyceride. So if we look at the picture at the bottom, we can see this is a triglyceride. We know it's made from one glycerol bonded to three fatty acids via the ester bond. So the oxygen here in the middle, that was originally part of the OH group of the glycerol. That is bonded to the carbon of what was the carboxyl group of the fatty acid via what we call the ester bond. Now lipase, the active site of lipase, recognizes and is complementary in shape to this part of the triglyceride. And it inserts water into the ester bond to hydrolyze the bond and cleave off the glycerol from the three fatty acids. So you end up with a single glycerol molecule with the OH groups being reestablished. And you end up with three fatty acids with the OH group on the carboxyl group reestablished. And we know the carboxyl group is on the left side of the fatty acid linked to the hydrocarbon chain and a terminal methyl group. Now this picture, we can see there's C to C, carbon to carbon single bonds throughout the length of the hydrocarbon chain. So this must be a saturated fatty acid because there's also maximum hydrogen. Now if we had an unsaturated, a mono unsaturated fatty acid, 
we would have one C to C double bond and less than maximum hydrogen. And if it was a polyunsaturated fatty acid, we'd have two or more C to C double bonds in the hydrocarbon chain. And again, less than maximum hydrogen, like so. Now, because fatty acids are what we call hydrophobic, so they're not charged and they're not polar. Therefore, these fatty acids cannot just be absorbed across the epithelial cells of the ileum into the blood plasma of the capillaries inside the villus or villi. Instead, what happens is fatty acids are absorbed into the lacteal inside each villus. And we know the lacteal is a lymph vessel. Now inside the lacteal, the fatty acids are actually uh, they're converted back into triglycerides, a lot of them. And they're transported in these spheres called lipoproteins. Now the lipoproteins eventually end up being uh, put back into the bloodstream. Now these can uh, quite happily travel in the blood plasma throughout the body. And inside them are the triglycerides and the fatty acids. And they're delivered to where they're needed in the body. And there's two types of lipoprotein that contain triglycerides triglycerides and fatty acids one is called LDL and that's low density lipoprotein and one is called HDL or high density lipoprotein now LDL is um, it's a lipoprotein that contains triglycerides and many saturated fatty acids and it also contains uh, a molecule called cholesterol So if there's too many low density lipoproteins or LDLs, they can quite often stick together and clump together in the wall of arteries. And that can lead to atherosclerosis, which is a, a narrowing of the lumen of certain arteries around the body because of the accumulation of these LDL particles in the blood that carry and contain fatty acids and triglycerides. Now, if we look at this picture, we can see there's a number of glands involved in digestion of food uh, throughout the uh, digestive system. Now, some of these glands are called accessory glands because they uh, are located outside the, the gut or the alimentary canal. So things like the liver, which is this kind of pink organ here, we know the liver makes and secretes bile, which is stored in the gallbladder. That's an accessory gland. We also know the pancreas makes pancreatic juice that contains a number of digestive enzymes like trypsin and um, pancreatic amylase and lipase. That's also an accessory gland because it sits outside the alimentary canal. So we know the salivary gland, uh, they're located in the mouth or the buccal cavity, uh, otherwise known as the pharynx. We know the salivary glands secrete a watery substance that contains both mucus to help lubricate the food as we mechanically break it down so we can swallow it down the esophagus into the stomach. The, um, the mucus also contains salivary amylase, which starts the hydrolysis of starch into maltose. Now, the gastric glands we know are located in the wall of the stomach lining. And we know gastric glands contain things like oxyntic cells, chief cells, and goblet cells. So the oxyntic cells make hydrochloric acid. The chief cells make pepsinogen, which will be converted by the acid into active pepsin and endopeptidase. And the goblet cells make mucus that allows a, a lining of mucus on the inside of the stomach wall to uh, prevent digestion by the acid and the peptidase enzymes. So these gastric glands are located in the inner mucosus of the uh, stomach wall. So if you ever see the word gastric, it refers to stomach because we know things like a gastric band can be placed around the stomach to uh, make the volume of the stomach smaller so that the person with the gastric, gla uh, gastric band becomes full more quickly. So there you go. Now, the liver, we just said, is an accessory gland. It's located outside the alimentary canal. And we know it makes bile, which is stored in the gallbladder, which gets secreted uh, down into the uh, duodenum via the bile duct. We know the pancreas is also an accessory gland outside the alimentary canal. 
We know it secretes pancreatic juice into the duodenum that starts the breakdown of lipids as well as the continuation of protein uh, breakdown into shorter polypeptide chains. Uh, Bruner's glands are located in the submucosa of the uh, duodenum. So the duodenum is the first 20 centimeters of the small intestine and the Bruner's glands secretes an alkaline mucus, which helps to neutralize the acidic bolus of food from the stomach. And it also protects the epithelial lining of the small intestine from digestive enzymes. So the epithelial cells do not themselves start to become digested. Now we know there are small glands along the length of the ileum, which is the remainder of the small intestine. And the inner mucosa um, at the base of the villi is where we'll find these small glands that secrete many enzymes, including lipases to finalize the digestion of triglycerides and also exopeptidases to allow the cleaving of amino acids from the end of the short polypeptide uh, fragments. Now, we also need to know what these breakdown products of digestion are really used for. Well, we know amino acids, when they get into the bloodstream, they're transported throughout the body and these get absorbed by all the cells of the body and they get used in protein synthesis. So, for example, muscle cells make muscle fibers inside the cell needed to allow the muscle cells to contract. We know all cells of the body have to make enzymes, for example. Some cells will make uh, things like collagen, the fibrous proteins. Now, we know excess amino acids cannot be stored. So once inside the liver cells, the amine group is uh, cleaved off, NH2. The amine group is then converted to urea by combining it with carbon dioxide. And uh, that's transported in the blood to the kidney. And urea is then filtered out of the kidney by ultrafiltration. And it ends up as urine, which we then excrete from the body. Now, we know fatty acids and glycerol are absorbed into the lacteal inside each villus. Now, fatty acids are a very good source of energy because they've got lots of carbon to hydrogen in the hydrocarbon chain. So uh, lipids yield twice as much energy compared to the same mass of carbohydrate, which is why we actually store um, energy as uh, fatty acids and triglycerides inside our adipose tissue. So inside the adipose tissue, i.e. the fat cells of your body, we will have lots of um, triglycerides. So the fats that are not immediately used in uh, respiration can also be stored as triglycerides. We also know fatty acids are needed to make phospholipids. And we know phospholipids are needed to make not just cell membranes, the phospholipid bilayer, but also the membranes of organelles within the cells. So things like the double nuclear envelope, which is made of two phospholipid bilayers, the double membrane of mitochondria, the inner and the outer membrane, the membranes of rough endoplasmic reticulum and smooth endoplasmic reticulum, etc. We also know fatty acids are needed and triglycerides as part of uh, the fat tissue, the adipose tissue underneath the skin for uh, thermal insulation. So we are um, organisms that maintain a core body temperature. So to help keep some of that heat energy within uh, the blood, we have uh, a thermal layer to prevent too much heat being lost. Now, we know glucose is needed by every cell of the body to be respired through glycolysis in the cytoplasm. And we know the mitochondria, if there's oxygen present, will continue the breakdown of uh, the glucose, i.e. the pyruvate, and uh, produce lots and lots of ATP for all the activities within the cell that require energy, like protein synthesis, DNA replication, and um, things like exo and endocytosis.